Hello everyone. In this tutorial series, we're going to break down standard gameplay features that are included in almost every single game we've played and also something that players have come to expect. This includes a menu system, saving and loading games, picking up items, player scoring, loading maps, etc. What makes this series unique as opposed to other series on YouTube is that we're going to show you how to do it cohesively. Now, you can learn about the save system in a bubble and you can learn about the game instance in another bubble, but how do you make them work together? That's what we're going to try to demystify. So here's a quick demo of what to expect. We have a main screen. If we press start, there will be a little dimming in the background. There's no save data. Enter a name for your save data. We'll call him AARON. Accept. AARON exists. We can delete AARON and then start. And we'll have JQuellen. Accept. If we press start again, we'll be teleported into the first level. You'll see a bunch of coins. We can pick them up. The coin counter on the top left will go up as we go. If we go through a portal, we'll be teleported to a second area. If we go back in the first portal, again, our cache is the same. The coins we picked up have disappeared. They no longer exist. We can toggle a menu to continue, save, or go back to the main menu. Continuing will make you come back. Saving will save your position. If you go back to the main screen, you're still there. You can start, and you're back to where you saved. If we pick up some skull and crossbones, you will die. You can continue and go back to the last save state you had, or you can go to the main screen and start all over again. Picking up hearts will restore your health. And again, going back into the portal, the health will remain the same. So before we settle into starting off anywhere, we should start with the most basic parts. The first one we're going to look at is the game instance. So when you start the game, this is now your game instance. It's basically the program itself. It is an overarching and encompassing object that manages the entire game. There's only one, it's completely unique, and I'll show you how to set it up in a moment. And basically it cannot be changed, destroyed, or recreated. It's, it's a fully persistent uh, object. So if you are opening the game, the game instance exists. When I close the game, the game instance has been closed. Now, to create your own game instance, we've created one here, right click, Go into Blueprint class and look for Game Instance, this one. And then out of it, you can create your own. Once you created your Game Instance, you can go Edit, Project Settings. And in the Project Settings, if you look for Game Instance, here you can choose what class to use. You can use the default one or you can add your own custom one, which is what we did here. This is what I meant by this is unique. Additionally, the game instance can be accessed through any blueprints by using the function get game instance, after which you can simply cast into your own game instance, and you can even convert it to a pure cast since it's a surefire cast. There's no other game instances in the game. So the overarching hierarchy or structure that we're going to be using throughout this uh, tutorial is that the game instance is going to be our be all and all manager. So other actors will interact with our player character and our player character will communicate this to the game instance. The player controller will also talk to the player character, but it will also communicate with the game instance. And finally, widgets and their buttons will transmit in what needs to be done to the game instance and the game instance will resolve the tasks. So for instance, if I click the save game button in the widget, it will first be transmitted to the game instance who will then perform the task to save the game. Similarly, if there is data to be given back and forth between the save game and the actual game, the game instance will handle that transfer. So you can save the game on the hard uh, disk and 
this will remain unchanged. You can transmit it to the game instance, and while you play the game, the game instance will update the data while never touching your previous save. However, if you commit your save, you will bring it, you will basically override everything from the save game with the new information in the game instance. This is how powerful this tool can be. In our case here, the first function that we will input in the uh, game instance will be the loading screen. So many widgets and many uh, classes can create loading screens, but it's always best to leave it to the game instance so it always keeps track of, is there a loading screen right now? And if there is, do I remove it? As such, you can create the two functions to remove the loading screen or to create the loading screen. To remove, make a validated get. You can do so by right-clicking and either get convert to pure get or convert to validate get. If it is valid, remove it from the parent. To create the loading screen, simply do a validated get. If it exists, remove it and then add a new one on top to the player controller and then set it as the new loading screen. And finally, add the viewport. The next thing we will be looking at is the save game. But before we go further, we're gonna work with structs. So for those who don't know what a struct is, you can basically add any sort of variables in it and you can even add more structs in it as we will see soon. So the first struct we will create is called the struct underscore character stats and in it we'll add health, coin count, and the name. Integer, integer, and a string. I highly recommend that you add some default values. For instance, for health, if you add zero, you'll probably trigger death, and we don't want to do that. And for the name, having a default name helps to know if your save data is actually working correctly. We chose Brian for this case. Next, we're also gonna look at another struct that is gonna store other types of data, including the character stats that we've, as we've created earlier. So here we have character stats as a struct in a struct. We're also gonna keep the last level we saved at as a string the last save transform point as a transform, and finally, GUIDs. A brief note on GUIDs. GUID stands for, I believe, Global Universal Identification. It's a random piece of letters and uh, numbers that you can generate that will always be unique. You can definitely use this to track several things. You can track events, you can track items being picked up, you can track if you have a multiplayer game and you have specific gear items, you can track if, if the data matches the server with unique tags, and so on and so forth. In this example, this will be used to track whether or not we've collected coins. The next thing we can do is create a save game. Simply right click, go to the blueprint class, type save game, and then make your own. We called our save game my save game. Once you open it, all you have to do is add as a variable your save data struct. Here you can see what it looks like broken down. If you get it, you can break it into the character stats, the last level save that, the last save transforms, and the GUID arrays. And if you break the character stats further, you can actually access more data. This will be the basis for the saving and loading into the game instance. To briefly touch upon these three nodes, when you save game to slot, you're going to need the save game object type and you need to know the slot. Next, you can also load from a slot if you have a slot name and return a value. And finally, you can always get a boolean to know if your slot is cleared or not. In this case, if I choose to load or save to my save game, I would do something like this. Load game from slot call my slot one, return the value. Slot one will identify which save game it is. And then I can cast into it and obtain more data through it. The second thing we'll be looking at in the basic game instance for now is the main menu uh, functions. So we're gonna set up the main menu functions first 
and then we're going to call these functions from the main menu itself. So the first function is, of course, you have to show your main menu, obviously. So again, do a validated get. If it exists, remove it and add it again. And set it as your new variable that you validated earlier and add to the viewport. The reason we do this is because we don't want to stack multiple widgets on top of each other. If you don't do this here and you do it at the widget level, for instance, and you click a button, you may stack multiple times the same widget. New game is going to be a function that's going to check, first of all, for a game slot. So when we click the new game button, first, it will need to know which new game do you want. For the purposes of this demo, all game slots will be hard coded as one, two, or three. So the first thing we're going to do is do another validated get. We're going to remove it from parent if it exists. Otherwise, we're going to create the widget and set it in our window. Basically, if we want the new game window to pop up, this is how you would do it. Next, the loading game. So we need to know what slot we're going to load the game from. Then we're also going to set the slot to our current slot. So this is a variable that the game instance will hold throughout the duration of the game. It needs to know at all times in what current save slot is it working with. If the save slot exists, which we do a check here, we'll simply load it, cast into it, then we'll create the loading screen as we've done previously, and then we'll push some of the data in it as our temporary data in the game instance. And finally, we're going to open the last saved level. If no saved levels exist, we're going to open level one by default. If the save game does not exist, we're going to throw an error. And finally, deleting the game. We're going to need to save slot again. We're going to need to know if the save game exists. If it does, delete it. When we started the game earlier, we had this widget pop up. So let's briefly take a look at it and learn how we can actually make widgets with more ease. So the first thing is that we created something called a vertical box. So vertical boxes are containers that will stack objects inside vertically. Next, it contains a horizontal box. It actually contains three horizontal boxes. Each horizontal box will then contain three other objects a border, which contains the new game title, a size box that contains the start button, and a delete button. The size box itself is another container that can determine a fixed uh, width or height. The great things about using vertical boxes or horizontal boxes as opposed to uh, dragging individual components is that if you need to move something at any point, you can do so by simply selecting the whole item at once, as we can see here. If I wanted to move the entire vertical box, I can just select it. And move it around. Another thing is if you want to center it, pick the uh, highest uh, hierarchy parent and the alignment the alignment will be between zero and one which is basically like a coordinate percentage and you can choose where your point uh, of alignment is if you choose 0.5 and 0.5 the alignment point will be dead center and then you can switch the position x and y to zero zero and have it again dead centered anchored let's take a look at the actual graph itself. So first things first is start game. So when you click the start game button, as we've seen earlier, one of two things will happen. Either it will help, it will toggle a, let's create a save game state, or it will just start your game. So the first thing we're going to do is if we have a slot name, we need to know, does a save game exist in that slot? If it does load the game, based on the function in the basic game instance that we've created earlier. If it does not exist, again, cast to the basic game instance and create the new game 
with a new slot. Since this is a repeating function, we've made it a general method, custom event. And then when we click on start one, we're gonna do start game event. And we're gonna make a little string for the slot name being one. Again, you can make this anything you want. For the purposes of this tutorial, we decided to make it a hard-coded value of one, two, and three. For the delete game function, similarly to the creating game, when you click into it, let's get the game instance, cast into it, and get the delete game with the slot we want to delete, as we've seen earlier. If we go back to the basic game instance, we can see what these functions were earlier, create a new game, load the new game, or load game actually, and delete game. The next thing we're gonna look at briefly is making a new game. So here we also added a border in the back that's slightly dimmed, just so we can emphasize that this is what you need to do right now. The event graph will have three events. The first one is on text changed which can be done to set a variable at any point. So whenever the user types something, it will set the variable. Um, this allows you also for more flexibility. For instance, if you don't want special characters, you can always manipulate the string here or the text to make sure to do a check. If it's invalid, you can make a message appear. If it's valid, you cannot. Uh, this makes it easier for uh, players, if they have trouble creating names, instead of always pressing accept and getting an error message, they can get the error message on the fly. Once you click accept, we're going to create a new save game object. We're going to have to define the class. That save game object, we're going to save it to the new game slot. The game slot, by the way, is instance editable and exposed on spawn. So when we create the new game here, create new game widget, the same variable is exposed. Now, if it doesn't appear to you, you might need to recompile it a couple of times, both in the game instance and in your widget, close it and open it again. It's perfectly normal. And what happens is that when you call the new game function with the game slot, it will be directly fed into the blueprint or the widget before it appears. So it already has the information ahead of time. So once this information is known, it's fed into the save game. We're then gonna load from that save game. We're gonna cast into it. Then we're gonna get our save data. We're gonna break it apart. And the character stats, the name that we've included here, which is the, uh, the variable that is saved on text changed, we're gonna set that specifically using the set members instruct. So we don't have to set anything else. This is great because we don't want to set the health or the coin count. We just want to set the name. And finally, once it's set, we're just going to save the game to slot again and remove it from parent. And finally, if we click cancel, we'll simply remove this widget from the parent. The next thing we'll look at is how to create a loading screen. Now, because of how fast the computer loaded everything, we didn't really have a chance to see it. But you may need to actually have a loading screen in your case. So what we did here is we just made a border that's completely black and we added something called a circle of throbber dead in the center. And so it just rotates. There are no functions here. And so the end result is when you press play, you can delete the data, you can start and create new data, And if the game slot exists, or the save slot exists, you can start the game. That's it for part one. So far, we've covered the main menu, creating a new game and saving an existing game, and a little bit of the game instance. Next week, we'll be releasing a second video in the series, which will cover the many different types of actors used in this project. So be sure to subscribe to get notified when we upload. The source code for this project is in early access on our Patreon until the final video is released. So if you want to check out the rest of the features right away, head on over to the Patreon and please support us. Thanks as always for watching and we'll see you next time.